On November the 30th, 1939, a new theater of war was opened up. The Soviet Union invaded its tiny neighbor, Finland. Finland had only achieved independence from the Russians in 1918 and hated them. Soviet dictator Josef Stalin was convinced that one day the Finns might allow the Germans in to attack Leningrad and the vital Arctic port of Murmansk. The Red Army outnumbered its Finnish opponents by more than 10 to 1. The invasion should have been a walkover. But its leadership had been devastated by Stalin's terrible purges. The Finns were led by General Gustav Mannerheim. He fought back using hit and run tactics amid the deep snow, often on skis. The Soviet troops, confused and poorly led, suffered massive losses. Finland's gallant resistance caught the imagination of the British and French. Soon they were planning to send help via Norway and Sweden. The fact that this might suck two neutral countries into the war was ignored. But a renewed Soviet offensive at the beginning of February broke the Finnish defensive line. In early March, the Finns had to cede territory to Stalin. By now, Hitler too had become interested in Scandinavia. The Nazi war machine relied on iron ore from Sweden. In the winter months, the only way it could get to Germany was via the Norwegian port of Narvik. If the Allies landed in Norway, this vital supply could be cut off. So he ordered plans to be prepared for an invasion of Norway. Denmark, which was in the way, would also have to be seized. The Norway theater heated up on February the 16th, 1940. The British destroyer Cossack boarded the German supply ship Altmark in a Norwegian fjord to release prisoners. Then on April the 9th, German troops began landing at five ports. Oslo, Kristiansand, Bergen, Trondheim and Narvik. At the same time, men of their newly formed German parachute division seized Stavanger and Oslo airfields. The Norwegian defenders were swiftly overwhelmed. As were the Danes. German forces occupied their country within 24 hours. In Norway, the Germans moved swiftly to link up their beachheads and seize all the major towns. In the air, the Luftwaffe had total control. The Allies now responded. A landing force was dispatched to recapture Narvik. French and Norwegian forces achieved this on May the 28th but a substantial German force was now approaching. So six weeks later, the Allies abandoned Norway to its fate. Hitler had spent most of that winter and spring at his country retreat, the Berghof in southern Bavaria. For him, the events in Scandinavia were a sideshow. Instead, he was preparing for his next major blitzkrieg against Britain and France. The first plan his generals brought him had a familiar ring to it. The Germans would advance into Belgium, aiming to swing down towards Paris. It was a repeat of the Schlieffen plan, which the Germans had used at the start of World War I. The Allies were expecting this and their main strategic discussion was how to prepare for it. 
When the Germans attacked, the Allies planned that their forces west of the Maginot Line would swing forward into Belgium to hold them on the shorter and more defensible line of the rivers Dial and Meuse. Then, on January the 10th, 1940, a German liaison aircraft lost its way and crashed in Belgium. A copy of the German plan was found. This convinced the Allies that their dial plan must be right, and they deployed their troops accordingly. Unfortunately, the same event made the Germans alter their ideas entirely. Chief planner General Erich von Manstein had always thought the original plan unimaginative. He was worried that the German forces would become bogged down, as in World War I, and that his country would lose a long, drawn-out war. So he proposed to Hitler that the main thrust should be made at the point where the Maginot Line ended, and where the Allies were most vulnerable as their Western armies moved forward. Virtually all Germany's panzers would be gathered opposite the Ardennes in southeast Belgium. The Allies considered this hilly and wooded area almost impassable for tanks. It was therefore lightly defended. The plan was to drive deep behind the Allied armies, which would have advanced into Belgium. They could then cut them off, and all the forces sitting in the Maginot Line would be bypassed. It was a high-risk strategy. The German armor could become stuck in the forest, but Hitler loved it. So the German forces were redeployed without the Allies knowing. The Allies, meanwhile, prepared for their long defensive war. In addition to the formidable barrier of the Maginot Line, they had a slight advantage both in manpower, some 110 divisions available against 95 German, and in armor, about 3,000 vehicles against 2,700. The French also had the better tanks. Their 32-ton Char Bay had both 75 and 47 millimeter guns. Its disadvantage was that the main gun was mounted in the hull and so was difficult to aim. The other gun was in a one-man turret from which the commander had to control the tank as well as man the gun. In contrast, the newest German design, the 17-ton Panzer Mark IV, had a 75mm gun in a spacious three-man turret so its crew could work as a team though only about a hundred were available. The other main French tanks also had guns which matched those of their German counterparts, but again the French had the one-man turret. The one area where the Germans had a clear advantage was in the air. The Luftwaffe had 2,000 bombers, the Allies just 800. The Luftwaffe had 4,000 fighters, including the ultra-modern Messerschmitt VF-109. They faced just 2,500, mainly older aircraft. The Royal Air Force did have about 800 excellent Spitfire and Hurricane fighters, but it was keen to keep them for home defense. But the main difference between the two armies was in philosophy. Everything the Germans did was focused on the possibilities of Blitzkrieg. All their armor was grouped in ten independent panzer divisions. But the French were preparing for a repeat of the static fighting of World War I. They saw tanks as infantry support and distributed them piecemeal instead of concentrating them. They had noticed the success of Germany's panzers in Poland, so they were assembling three armored divisions. But by the start of hostilities, none was fully operational. Two totally different ways of military thinking were about to go head to head. Blitzkrieg against static warfare. 
the summer of 1940 would soon show which was correct.